going to talk a little about immunotherapy, a lot of uh, this is already said today, rationale, current data, and a little bit about future directions. So to address the elephant in the room, before the HPV era, all studies in head and neck cancer was all commerce of head and neck sites, except maybe cup nasopharynx was taken out, but usually all entities were in. So we have to, uh, we, we have become uh, a lot more smarter and we start designing purely oropharynx cancers, for instance. So this is the mach NC update published in 2021. We have talked of it already. This is about the rationale or reasoning for combined chemo radiation. And uh, we know that the best form to give combined chemo RT if it's given concurrently, we have said today that already in extent. So that's why I wanna go over that. And one of the two um, take home messages was performance status two or more, we should not give concurrent chemo RT and patients over 70, we should not give it because the, the benefit basically is completely gone, which decreases at the age of 65. So we have to keep this in mind in tumor board. And I've already mentioned the long-term update of the R2G study. These are the studies, the R2G, EURTC, uh, which introduced the rationale for adjuvant chemo radiation. And we know that with the update, um, only the local regional control was better and disease-free survival. There was no benefit in overall survival anymore with concurrent adjuvant chemo RT. And you see that I summarized the table a little bit and um, put it together. So only patients with extra cups of extension and uh, positive for section marks, they actually benefit from adjuvant chemo radiation with improved local control and disease-free survival. There's no benefit for overall survival. We have to keep this in mind and argue in tumor board. And the number of positive nodes does not seem to be relevant for the benefit of chemo radiation. That's at least the message from the long-term data. And then there was a long debate, at least between oncologists, how do we give the platinum, give, do we give it every three weeks, uh, the high dose 100 milligram per meter square, or we give it weekly 40. We always have a long time giving it 40 because it's better manageable with toxicity. And finally, there was this academic trial run by the Japanese oncology group phase two, three trial with 260 patients and all commerce of cancers locally advanced stage three, four. And we basically know now it's not inferior, it's at least equally, even though this trial showed that given 40 per week is better than all endpoints, but it's only one trial and nobody's gonna ever gonna repeat this trial because it's not sexy for any pharmaceutical company. And we have started, we have tried to run this or participate in this trial uh, from the EORTC, it didn't work because of the money, but the Japanese people, they carried it all through and we know we can give 40 milligrams from meter square without any problems. Uh, even though in, in the States, I think it's still the high dose is uh, the standard. So this we have seen already a couple of times uh, today. This is the Key and Ang study that actually showed in a post hoc analysis um, from patients treated in a trial that looked at different fractionation regimens. They took all the oropharyngeal cancer out, stained it for P16 and showed that the P16 positives oropharyngeal cancer patients had a much better outcome than the P16 negatives. And that basically gave Past, uh, paved the way for the thoughts and um, ideas that we carrying around today. So question, do we can, can we de-escalate treatment for these patients under the premise that HPV positive cancers have a very good prognosis with an expected overall survival of more than 90%. And you can go that different ways. And we have talked about trans oral surgery and even induction chemotherapy comes again into the picture. I reported from the ESMO a keynote lecture that um, the way it's probably going to go is that we have to do multimodal treatment and to, to with the goal to de-escalate all parts of the treatment with omitting or reduct, reduce the dose of radiation or mid chemotherapy. We have to consider the dose, the volume of radiation and systemic treatment to reduce long-term toxicity and morbidity while preserving the excellent survival these patients have. So we have to remember the escalation for HPV positive patients based on P16. And remember most trials 
uh, classify HPV associated or pharyngeal cancer only based on P16 with all the problems. We know that there might be up to 20% uh, false positives and false negatives. So we know that omitting platinum and changing it for cetuximab was negative in two trials mentioned today, to, today already, the de-escalate and RTOG 1016. And there's two phase two trials that we have mentioned already today also that reduced those um, uh, treatment in the definitive in adjuvant setting might work for P16 positive or pharyngeal cancer. I don't wanna go into much detail because of the time, but we have discussed this already today a couple of times. So I wanna skip these slides. So uh, the NRG trial, I find interesting uh, that uh, at least 72% uh, had the minimum dose of 200 milligrams per meter square. We know that from the meta-analysis that patients who receive at least 200 milligrams per meter square cisplatin do better than patients receiving less in terms of outcome. So that means patients should at least have two cycles of 100 milligrams per meter square cisplatin or five cycles, uh, each 40 milligrams per meter square. All patients that were randomized once they started radiation completely the full course of radiation. And we know um, that the medium follow-up is not even three years. But what I found interesting in this trial is that the most common site of first failure for patients in the chemo radiation arm was distant metastasis, even though they had cisplatin. Or for patients who had the radiation only, uh, the uh, first site of failure was local regional and out of that two thirds at the primary site, which kind of tells us that if you give combined chemo radiation that this platinum does have nearly no systemic benefit or effect. So we have to keep that in mind. So this study we have mentioned today already a couple of times. Uh, I don't want to go into that in detail. Uh, they looked at less dose, 50 gray versus standard dose, 60 gray. And we've seen that already a couple of times. Um, we talk about the intermediate group risk patients with close margins, two to four metastatic lymph nodes, and looking again at reduced dose of adjuvant treatment versus standard dose of adjuvant treatment. And we've seen those um, graphs already today too. So the curves are basically overlaying, suggesting that this is completely appropriate to give only 50 gray in the adjuvant setting to the intermediate group instead of 60 gray. And the NRG trial in the a definitive setting showed us that for low risk disease, meaning early T and early N or little N burden, nodal burden, that it looks like a 60 gray is totally sufficient instead of 70 gray combined with 40 milligram weekly cisplatinum. What we do need is long-term data, of course, especially with, in terms of toxicity. So having like a two-year endpoint doesn't really mean anything. We've talked about this dysphagia. We see patients, when we follow them for five, six, seven, 10 years, people come up with dysphagia as late as 10 years. So phase three data would be really helpful to uh, actually come to a conclusion to that. We've talked about the PATHOS study already uh, in the adjuvant setting. I find it difficult at least to recruit patients in my centers where I go to the tumor conferences. One of the PATHOS um, requirements is that the patient has to be informed of the trial before he goes to surgery, which for some reason is very uh, difficult to implement in daily practice. And the other point we always have difficulty is a lot of patients are still smoking and present with N2B disease, so which they cannot classify to be patients in this trial. So we've talked about that, and I think that is a really clean, very nice trial, and that hopefully will eventual, eventually answer the question whether 50 gray is sufficient for the intermediate group uh, risk patient. So we have talked about the radar uh, trial too as well already, so I don't want to get into much detail. Um, I don't think anybody after the ORADO-1 trial or the original ORADO trial would say, well, radiation is better than uh, surgery and adjuvant treatment, but I find it uh, very disappointing, we've seen that already too, that this trial was stopped. I think that was fatal because... Um, it was probably just bad luck, I don't know, but uh, even me as a radiation oncologist, I will not say, you know, uh, radiation is superior to, to the other arm of the trial. So it closed prematurely, we all know that because of the two treatment related deaths. Um, I think from the two trials, we can at least say that um, both therapies for the early stage disease is probably equivalent. 
the functional outcome is equivalent. And I think we need mature data from the study, even though it's only a few patients or not many patients, but uh, we need to wait for the long-term data. And I'm personally very sad that this uh, study was closed for me too early. So jumping to immunotherapy, which I think is a very interesting topic. And we've heard already that uh, in the definitive setting, it's not very, uh, successful until today and I have my theory for that. So we need to have the right therapy for the right in the right sequence for the right patient at the right time. So these are all questions I think we don't have really resolved yet. The uh, the uh, the advantage of immunotherapy is that it has a complete different toxicity profile and we know from the recurrent metastatic setting with immunotherapy, somehow the, the curve stay level while we give combined chemo RT, um, the survivor is pretty bad. We have less than 50% long-term survivors. So what is this with the radiation and um, immunotherapy? So it's a very interesting if, and I think it's dose dependent. So a lot of uh, studies and data from preclinical studies and uh, from, from stereotactic radiotherapy, I think it's dose dependent. So if you give normal fractionation, like two gray a day or 1.8 a gray a day, that's what we usually give. It uh, does something different. It does immune um, uh, stimulatory and immunosuppressive effects. So if you give a normal dose of two gray, it uh, leads into reprogramming of macrophages, recruitment of T cells, and it comes to the apoptotic pathway, the anti-inflammatory pathway. So it's immunosuppressive. But if you give a higher dose per fraction, like five gray, like we give hypofractionation in, in lung cancer, for instance, it causes necrosis, so completely presenting the antigen to the T cell system, to the immune system. And uh, it, follows, it follows the immunogenic cell death, immune stimulatory effects of radiation. And then you can even enhance this if, give, if you give radiation therapy in, uh, in hyperthermia at the same time. Of course, hyperthermia is not really in routine practice, but in, in experimental studies, it suggests that that's a good combination. So we remember the Javelin had 100 was negative. The Gortec REACH trial was negative and the Keynote 412 was negative. That was just presented uh, on Monday at the Esmond Paris. So this is all bad news. So where we go from here, this is just a short um, reminder how the Javelin 100 study went. So it gave a value map and then a loading dose, then combined chemo RT, RT and immunotherapy, and then it gave maintenance, uh, immune checkpoint Im inhibition and control arm was just placebo. And it was nearly 700 patients. And we all know um, the study was closed prematurely because it wouldn't meet the endpoint. And this was the Gortec REACH trial that had a platinum fit and platinum unfit cohort and the platinum unfit, they received tetoximab, as you can say, uh, as you can see here with avelumab. So, and at the end, again, uh, unfit or fit cohort, there was no difference uh, with the immunotherapy for both uh, groups. And then that's the keynote 412 that was just uh, published or, or presented. Again, it gives pembrolizumab combined with chemo radiation and maintenance pembrolizumab and compared to the placebo. So why is that? I skipped that because we have talked about that. We have talked about that. So why is that? Um, and I wonder always whether we can learn from other entities and we have to have our experience and then uh, give mistakes out the room that they need. So can we learn from other entities? So if you look at the uh, NC, NCNN guidelines for biomarker for squamous cell cancer, cancer, and I tried to compile that in one table. And if you look at the oropharynx, which is the third line from the bottom, it's P16. We all know P16 is not a really good biomarker. PDL1, maybe not. EGFR, maybe not. And then we have NTRAC, which is expressed by in 6% of the patients. So we really don't have biomarkers for head and neck, especially oropharynx cancer. And now we have data coming up with ctDNA as a biomarker that we can monitor before treatment, during treatment, and after treatment, which might be really the way to go. I believe very much in it. So how do we combine chemotherapy or radiation chemotherapy with the immunotherapy? 
So again, we have to, the goal is tumor cell killing and we have to induce an anti-tumor immunity and we have local, we have to have local and systemic effects. Systemic effects, we know that HPV related head and neck cancer has a higher rate of distant metastasis than classic head and neck cancer. So we have to balance that. So on the left panel, you see a typical radiation uh, plan for a head and neck cancer. You see nice parotid sparing. You see the different neck levels. You treat all the neck nodes. On the right side, you have an anal cancer patient. I know it's the other end, but it's just important to know because there's a study going on right now. It's very similar. And when you radiate the inguinal nodes, the iliac node, external, internal, so you, you basically radiate the entire lymph node areas. And basically, you, lymph cells are the most radiosensitive cells. So if you give them 50 gray, they just, there's nothing left. So, and if you look at lung cancer, one of the speakers this morning mentioned the, um, the, the Pacific trial. And the Pacific trial was a trial for locally advanced lung cancer inoperable. And uh, it is PET plan based planning. So you treat only PET positive nodes or tumors or the tumor. So it's like a little to a lot, so a little doses to a lot uh, volume or high dose to a little volume. And the standardized treatment planning in the Pacific trial was that you really treat only the, the PET enhancing regions as opposed to the, all the elective, elective lymph node radiation in the entire mediastinum, the way we used to do it traditionally. And, um, and this treatment planning is based on the PET plan trial, which was um, run in Germany. The PET plan study in, in, in lung cancer randomized between the traditional planning, so any elective nodal radiation and the PET positive finding and compared to only PET positive findings radiation. And I think that's the base for the, for the uh, um, positive data from the Pacific trial, because there was no elective nodal radiation. So even if you give the immunotherapy, there was enough lymph node tissue that actually could do their job in response to the immunotherapy. And I think that's the way we go. And we have to do that probably for head and neck and for all the squamous cell cancer that we treat with immunotherapy. So, and which also gives room to dose escalation because you have only a small volume that you treat because in lung and other regions, the, the, the organs at risk are the ones that limitate the dose we can give. So if we give high dose to little volumes, it's probably much better than having all this elective nodal radiation. So coming back to summarize this, there's a lot of things we just don't know uh, in the combination of radiation, chemotherapy, and immunotherapy. We have the tumor microenvironment, which plays an important role when you give immunotherapy. The timing, the sequence, is it during chemo RT? Is it the maintenance afterwards, like it's done in the most trials in head and neck and in the Pacific trial? Or do we give a shot immunotherapy before, then we do surgery, and then we do definitive treatment? Nobody knows that. And then it's, of course, important which site you treat. The number of lesions, I think, is important. Then we come back to the volume effect. The microbiome is something very important. There's a lot of literature coming out the last couple of years. The microbiome actually decides what a patient does with the immunotherapy. A lot of things happen there, and I don't think we have understood the whole uh, uh, picture yet. And of course, we have to think about volumes uh, that we irradiate to give uh, to give the lymph node actually room to, or enough lymph tissue to respond. And of course, there's an issue of the dose and fractionation and looking 10 or 15 years, and this is probably my, my fantasy, it's probably that we have patients come in immunotherapy and we have to go away from all this every day, the same thing, every day two gray, every day 1.8 grade, probably you have to have an immune profile or biomarker and you say, today you get three gray, Next day, maybe no radiation, then you give five grays. So I think we have to do adaptive planning to the state of the immune system according to the stage of therapy. So to put it all together, surgery and radiation seem to be equivalent in outcome and function for early or pharynx cancer. I think we have shown that today. The classic platinum-based radiochemotherapy high dose or weekly remains the standard of care in the adjuvant and as well as in the definitive setting. Weekly regimen seems equivalent. Phase two data are promising for reduced dose of radiation or radiochemotherapy in the definitive as well as adjuvant setting. And as of now, we have said that today a couple of times, there's no, no, no de-escalation HPV positive disease outside the clinical trial. I think we have agreed on that. Immunotherapy, there's positive data in the primary setting, still lacking, even though we do have data in a recurrent metastatic setting, it basically changed the entire game plan. 
And so far, immune escape plays still a big role in tumor development and progression. Immunotherapy has expanded the portfolio of treatment options in our current metastatic setting. Data of immune checkpoint inhibition in the primary setting is still disappointing, but I think uh, it will come along. Peter one is not a perfect biomarker for efficacy of immune checkpoint inhibition, HPV status, is uh, we need to have genetic signatures. And as I said already to a colleague today, uh, I spoke to Keith Hunter last week. He's a good pathologist. I think he's in Sheffield now. He went from Liverpool to Sheffield. He said, there seems to be a shift from HPV 16 and 18 towards the 31 or 33. And even the HPV positive disease is, is as heterogeneous uh, disease as any disease else. So if we, if we talk about HPV positive, it's not all the same. We all know that we have HPV cases. We, we just cannot cure. They just galloping, the, you know. So it's heterogeneous. So we have to have more biology data on these patients as well. It's not just HPV. We do need preclinical studies for immunotherapeutic approaches and tumor microenvironment, which is very important, and microbiome. And for me, as a radiation oncologist, the timing sequence, radiation dose, radiation volume, elective nodal radiation should, uh, should be abandoned. And there's a question of fractionation, of course. And with that, I would leave you here and I'm happy to answer any questions. Did I keep my time? Good. Dr. Castle, yeah. are you there? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Silky, could I just ask you of your experience with immunotherapy in the metastatic setting? Uh, I treat melanoma as well as head and neck cancer, and I've had some fantastic results in melanoma. I've not really replicated those in head and neck, and I wondered what your experience was. So question, metastatic setting, what we do? Yeah, whether you've had any long-term uh, control of disease in the metastatic yes. setting with immunotherapy. Yes, we do. We do see some long-term survivors, but we, of course, don't know in advance who are these patients. And the problem, I, or I always feel it's difficult to decide when you sit in tumor board and you think, do you give immunotherapy as monotherapy or do you combine it with chemotherapy? That's always difficult. But um, we, do link, we do see long-term survivors with uh, only immunotherapy. And the oncologists, they always um, uh, refer to if a patient has to have response quickly because it has a full liver metastasis and lung metastasis are symptomatic, we tend to combine immunotherapy with chemotherapy. If we do feel we, have, we can wait for a response, then we do actually only immunotherapy. And I think the CPS plays a big role, the expression of PDL, PDL1. Yeah, the more press, the better the response. Yeah, absolutely. It's only yeah. half the story, though, really, isn't it? We, we, we need to sort out or select our patients better. Mm -hmm. And I think coming from the ESMO, it was a really great Congress. And there was a lot of papers and mini orals and posters on ctDNA as a uh, biomarker. So ideally it could be in a metastatic setting as well as in a primary setting. So if you have ctDNA before treatment and you follow ctDNA during treatment in a curative setting, I think this gives way how you de-escalate or escalate and you can decide that during the treatment. And that's actually really great data on anal cancer. I know I'm on the wrong end again, but there's a very good work uh, uh, from Denmark, from Aarhus. And they, what they did, very simple. They treated patients with anal cancer, which is treated uh, with primary radiation uh, and chemotherapy. And they looked at ctNA before treatment. They monitored during treatment and they showed very nicely a group of patients which cleared the ctDNA during treatment already. So in the first half of treatment, there was no ctDNA anymore. And then they have patients, they never cleared it. They go on and have distant metastasis. And then they have the intermediate group who uh, cleared the DNA very slowly with a long tail. So they need to be, have to have some maintenance or more intensive chemotherapy. So actually it implicates 
treatment decision while the patient's on decision. I think that on treatment, and I think that's the way we have to probably go in head and neck cancer as well. We can't treat everybody the same because everybody has the same different disease. Yeah, absolutely. This is great Thank you. basic science translated into clinic. Meaningful. This is a, uh, not a question, uh, just a comment that in the north, uh, northeast of England, we, we are struggling to see the same results with palliative immunotherapy in head and neck cancer, which have been uh, shown in the, in the clinical trial results. For pembrolizumab, for nivolumab, they, there are hardly any, any patients or long-term responders. I don't know whether there is any difference in patient population or something else, uh, but we are struggling. Yep. Uh, if I may, Silke. Point. That, that, that was an excellent talk. I, it's been, uh, I really enjoyed that. You really put together, pulled together a lot of uh, themes in and uh, uh, made it quite simple for our surgeons to try and understand. Uh, here's a question. So, uh, you know, I've raised this point before. I feel really, really bad as a society. We spent millions on Javelin 100, Keynote 0412, uh, the Gotek Reach. Uh, we have Compare going on, the NRG head and neck 005 is going on. So, so many millions of pounds and dollars spent on these. Is it a time to consider, sorry, it's a meta question, to consider moving trials, even in the primary setting, similar to what we're doing for the recurrent metastatic setting? Do we need more adaptive trial designs like in in lung cancer, for instance, Absolutely. where we perform peripheral blood cell testing, get a circulating DNA, look at the mutational marker, get a new drug off the shelf. We, we need to really think about sporting this kind of money into primary setting because this can't go on, uh, post-pandemic especially. Uh, I absolutely agree. And uh, I said already two years ago when, it, when, when, when Javelin came out, I said the keynote will be negative. And it's a shame. It's eight, more than 800 patients wasting so much money, so much lifetime and energy for nothing. It's clear. And the, in the Germany, there's an anal cancer trial that just looks chemo radiation followed by immunotherapy. It's going to be negative, no doubt about it. It's going to be negative because it's the same issue. There's no lymph node who can respond anymore because you give like 50 gray. The problem is while these trials get designed elaborately goes through all the committees they have to go through until it gets approved. Then you get the funding. I mean, the world goes on and we know much, you know, our knowledge goes so fast these days that, you know, basically when you start a trial design now, you, you can run the trial if you're lucky in like six, seven, eight years, then the time, you know, it's, it's already rubbish basically. And that's, that's Absolutely. the problem we have. And I don't know how, I mean, the States are much faster in things, but Europe is painful. It's really painful. In UK, I think I always admire the UK. I mean, you guys get pretty good stuff done, I have to say. I but know. I'm in the EORTC head and neck group. I mean, getting stuff done is impossible. It's really, really difficult. I think that's the issue. Yes, we have to be more agile, Absolutely. flexible, and adapt study designs while data coming out. I mean, it's very frustrating. I completely agree with you. It wastes patients' lives. It does. Thank you very much. We are.